Joel Rue, the chairman of the Bridge Tang, and we are happy to conduct today the second workshop in our series of three, uh, which are called and uh, co-organized with the AFD, the French uh, Bilateral Development Agency. Uh, and this series of workshops, as you all know, is devoted to understanding, mapping the uh, initiatives and gaps in actions uh, on the blue economy in uh, three countries uh, of the so-called Bay of Bengal, uh, namely Bangladesh, uh, India, and Sri Lanka. Uh, we've had a first workshop where we've started exploring uh, what are the uh, understanding by different actors from um, the academia a bit from uh, institutes, uh, technical institutes, some authorities. And today we continue this exercise uh, with uh, several presentations. And today we initiate also dialogue between uh, leading experts and leading institutes in the region, in the sub-region, and uh, the, the AFD. I'm uh, honored to, I will introduce the panelists uh, as they come on the floor and the discussants as well. Uh, but uh, I'm happy to co-chair uh, this session uh, with uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Helen Jufelkit, and uh, who is the uh, head of, uh, she's the director of research uh, at uh, the EFD. She's a, a seasoned specialist in matters of development. And I, I thank her particularly for having got the idea of, of exploring these issues of, of, on, the, on the blue economy. Uh, in, towards the end of the session, we'll also have a few words by Dr. Uh, Jackie Ampru, uh, who I guess in the discussion session, who's the director of, uh, uh, for South Asia, uh, for, for, for the AFD. Uh, let me not overuse my, uh, my holding the mic, but just uh, flag one thing that today uh, we, in this session, uh, and I welcome the audience who has gathered from different continents, from three continents at least, uh, to uh, be uh, today. Uh, today, we've decided to focus on a topic which may look dry to non-specialists or to uh, non-practitioners, uh, uh, which is data. Now, data is not dry. Data is at the heart, at the core of preserving the oceans, of developing them in a truly sustainable manner. Uh, and let me just one, flag one example. When we took for instance, on uh, over-exploitation of uh, fish reserves. We all know that for the last decade, at least, the most technologically advanced fleet of fisheries have uh, are equipped with radars of military type, are equipped with a direct connection to the stock markets. They identify, uh, they identify uh, uh, where the fish lies. With their software and the radars, they evaluate very precisely to a just few percent margin error uh, what's the weight of the fish. They don't catch the fish. They wait for the market value to rise on the markets. Then they pre-sell the fish. They've not even been catching. And then they catch the fish. The fish, sorry. That's data. And data has been used for, uh, uh, for um, empowering the resources of the ocean. Now it's high time that uh, data are used for the reverse, for sustainable ocean, for an understanding of the deep ocean and for an understanding of how oceans connect to the livelihoods on the coastal shores and all the uh, value chains which feed tens and hundreds of millions of people, especially in a region uh, 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 which is densely populated as the region we are talking about today. So for these reasons, I'm very happy that we get the chance again to discuss about this fascinating topic and that we have the greatest specialists and the greatest minds with us today to do that. Without further ado, uh, Ellen, I'll hand you over the floor. You might compliment uh, why uh, this is so important from the perspective of AFD representing France, I mean, being a French organization, friend, member of the French 
administration why we consider uh, from France uh, that the uh, resources of the blue economy in this part of the world matter for everyone, for this region, for us, for humanity. You might uh, be willing to flag also some of the learnings uh, we've had, and we all know that uh, learning is never ending, uh, especially as researchers like you are. Uh, learning leads to further questions, but in this case, uh, learning and questions uh, want to lead us towards action. Helen, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, and thank you to the speakers and uh, the, the audience. Yes, indeed, we are very happy to pursue the discussion on this very important topic of blue economy in the Bay of Bengal, and more precisely on the, on the, on the ocean resources. So why we are interested in this topic, of course, because of the economic and social importance of, uh, of these resources and the, of the ocean in the, in the region. Huh? Although it's difficult to, to assess the, the real part of, uh, of this activity uh, in the GDP, uh, researcher considers it's between three and 5% of the activity in, in the region, which is quite hard. It, it might be even more important in some countries such as in Indonesia, for instance. Um, it's really a huge part of the global trade as well. So it's, uh, it's an important activity. And in the social activity, uh, most of the employment uh, in some countries are uh, even in fisheries and in the blue economy. So this is really a development issue, and that's why it interests the AFD, especially in this part of the world where the climate pressure and the environmental change is very important. So there is a lot of pressure, and both anthropic and environmental. This is why it's very crucial to scrutinize what would, would be those impacts and what would be the priority of the different countries facing these challenges. And, and that was the purpose of the first workshop, to set the scene, to, to, to analyze the context and to draw on the, the priorities. So uh, we, we drew in the first uh, workshop uh, a lot of recommendations uh, on economic and social aspects because we have identified those aspects uh, as important. So in terms of challenges on the economic side, we have uh, um, flagged uh, three challenges. So the one uh, just mentioned in the pressure of the environment and anthropic activity on the, on the conservation of marine ecosystem, uh, which is uh, one of the importance. The second and the economic challenges is the, the disaster uh, management risk uh, in front of climate change for, for the activity of for the ocean activity. And um, the third one is a growing demand on, on fisheries uh, and, uh, on the ocean, both, uh, both on through fisheries and fish demand and, and tourism, which uh, adds to the pressure. On the social side, what was really important is uh, the, the food security issue because 50% uh, of the protein uh, adding uh, in the region is coming from fish, so it's not uh, uh, little things. Um, job uh, uh, access is as well important. As I said, a lot of people are working in, in this uh, value chain, so uh, it's important to assess what, what would be the impact of all of this uh, change. Um, and the climate change adaptation is a, also an important issue. So um, having said that, uh, I'm coming to data. Uh, what has been really the, 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 the focus is the lack of data uh, in the first workshop. That's why in this one, we are focusing really on the, on the data collection because data is very crucial for many aspects. Uh, first, to, of course, evaluate and uh, assess the, the, those pressure I mentioned uh, on, on different type of fish. Uh, it's very important to, to understand correctly what is going on uh, in this. Uh, the, the pressure on the climate, uh, on, uh, from the climate change uh, as well is really important to, to be assessed. And um, it's also important to have data to, to develop standards because after all, uh, what are the standards for, 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 for the good monitoring? And, uh, and this is a really a research uh, um, uh, action that has to be begin because uh, uh, standards in environment uh, are not really uh, international. And they are, they are, they, they, sometimes they do not exist. And uh, it's really crucial to assess the good uh, state of the environment environmental services. 
So uh, at the AFD, we are very uh, involved in such uh, activities uh, to, to assess the good standard of natural conservation uh, in, a, in, a, in a strong sustainability way, uh, considering that the resources are not sustainable, uh, not uh, substitutable, uh, sorry, uh, among each other. So they have to be assessed very eagerly and each one has to be assessed. And finally, uh, data collection is really important as well. And we consider that for uh, you know, uh, awareness uh, of both policy uh, makers and uh, of uh, civil society. Um, so that's why we wanted really to, to have this workshop uh, to put together different actors, as you said, it's really the fact that we have different uh, discipline, different, different uh, actors, both researcher, policymaker, economic actors, and uh, I expect that this discussion will be very fruitful and we will be able to dig in further in, uh, in the data uh, challenges and uh, priorities for, for different countries. Uh, I stop here and uh, I'll give you the floor back, uh, Joël. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, uh, uh, for setting this clear agenda. We uh, try to be at the at par with, uh, with, the, with the ambition. Uh, but it's an ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing dialogue. Uh, we'll start now with, uh, I'm very happy to give the floor to uh, Dr. Shailash Nayak because he's uh, uh, one of the leading specialists and uh, uh, Dr. Nayak is the, the head of the National Institute of Advanced Studies, which is an organization dear to my heart. I was trying to recall whether I went first to the NIS at the very end of the 20. A th uh, century or the beginning of the 21st century, but I would say it's been definitely more than 20 years that I've known the NIS, and it's my apology. I have to apologize that I haven't been there very recently since you, at least not since you came there, uh, uh, Shelash. Uh, let me just have a few words on of introduction on your, uh, I would say, career, but 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 skills. Uh, before being the director, uh, you have been a distinguished scientist. Uh, 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 you're a distinguished scientist, and you've been a secretary uh, at the Ministry of Earth uh, Sciences in the government of India. And uh, uh, it was you who provided leadership for many programs related to earth science, uh, earth system science uh, at that time. You're a geologist by training, which is uh, also dear to my heart as I uh, have fond memories of my youth uh, studying geology. And uh, you've been credited with launching many research programs related to monsoon, air uh, to sea interaction, changing water cycle, atmospheric chemistry, and coastal vulnerability climate services, which is uh, uh, very related to uh, the topic today uh, with a large cooperation with many, uh, with several countries. I just noticed from your bio that within the country, countries uh, with which you had a deep cooperation, France, uh, I would say so far, uh, has not been mentioned and uh, we are here uh, for that, hopefully. I just am saying that you're a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences in uh, Bengaluru and the National Academy of uh, Sciences in India. Uh, and uh, from our preparing uh, preparatory conversations, uh, we understood uh, that uh, today uh, you are going to talk a bit more, uh, flag the issues about the challenges of fisheries collection uh, in the context of climate change, about the coastal economic challenges, the marine biotechnology and data, and uh, as we hear for that, the way ahead. Uh, sir, you have 10 minutes for that, for this beautiful challenge of this very key points you have the floor and uh, thank you again for your participation and very welcome to our group you have the floor Shilash. thank you thank you joel it's real my pleasure to be participant in this uh, very important uh, discussion and uh, i have a few slides to introduce the subject so i will share it and the basic uh, thing which i think it is already stressed by Joel and Helen about the importance of the data and also the services which we need to provide. And uh, I think the we need to connect both the scientific information which we have, how we can 
convert this information into a knowledge or information which can be used by the stakeholders, in this case, a fisherman. And uh, the most important thing is the, as far as uh, the blue economy is concerned, I think fishery is one of the most important uh, component of the uh, blue economy. And it's not only about the fish, but I think we need to look at the entire uh, the system, including the coastal. So I will just like to give you the few idea about this. Uh, so basically, I would like to define the blue economy as ocean dependent economic development, which is essentially targeted to improve the quality of life of people. But at the same time, it should be inclusive social development and while maintaining the environment and ecological security. So it's not only the economic development, but we have to ensure both the environment and ecology are preserved for its sustainable use. And that is one reason the, the SDG goal 15, that how we can use sustainably use the ocean seas and marine resources. I think that should be our main area through which we should work. Now in India, we have been uh, working on this area for quite some time, for last almost 25 years. And I will just give you the glimpse of the area which we have been working. We also need to see the diversity, marine diversity part, the health of the coastal environment, and the most important, the ocean. I mean, the entire database which we have has to be a digital so that we can get the information about any point any time uh, and anywhere. Uh, this is the service which is we are providing to Indian uh, fishermen for last uh, 25 years, uh, where we provide the information that where the potential areas of a fishery. And the potential yield in Indian waters is about 5.31 million tons. And we are harvesting about 3.8 million tons. So most of the area which is be harvested is within the biological sustainable limits. So this is the one very important aspect because the one, the service which is essentially based on a chlorophyll which indicates the availability of a food and the environmental condition which is uh, we get by the sea surface temperature and sea surface wind and sea surface height. This, all these three are combined together into a model, and this information is provided to all the fishermen. Now, the, the main benefit which is coming is the environmental benefit because they don't have to search for the school of fish. So the reduction in a search time is about 60-70%. That means that much less carbon dioxide is put into the atmosphere. And the catch is increased about two to four times, and the success rate is about 80%. And this has substantially improved the economic condition of a fisherman, because for each trip, the minimum advantage which they make is about 250 US dollars. So this is a quite a bit of money each trip, the additional money by using uh, the advisory. So basically, we are reducing their effort to catch the fish. So that is where the economic advantage is coming. Along with this, we also provide the other ocean state information, which is uh, about the currents, waves, the mixed layer there, the sea surface temperature, the tides, and all this information together, uh, they could make very informed decision that where should go and what kind of uh, conditions would be there in that particular region. Of course, this forecast is also used by many other stakeholders, the shipping industry, ports, harbors, and many others. Now, this is the one part, but the also important is that we should also able to estimate what is the yearly or annually the pelagic fishery stock available. So here also the monthly climatology of sea surface temperature chlorophyll is being used to find out that what is likely primary productivity would be. And once we know the primary productivity, seasonal primary productivity, 
we can very well estimate that what would be the secondary and tertiary productivity, which gives us an idea that how much uh, potential yield would be available in a given region. Now, the, the third important aspect is the climate. In the many uh, areas, especially on the southwest coast of India, the two major fisheries, the oil sardine and mackerel, Indian mackerel, uh, has the catch has been reduced after 1985. And many times it has been said that it is mainly because of overfishing. But what we found is it's not necessarily only because of the overfishing, but because of the warming of the sea, the fishery has started shifting towards northwards, uh, which was essentially between 8 and 14 degree north, has now mostly shifted to 14 and 20 degree north and also on the east coast. So I think the warming of the sea is also definitely making a major change. And I think we need to collect the data about this, that how the things have changed over the last 50 years or so. We also need to look at the deep uh, sea resources. Mostly in India, uh, the fishery is mostly coastal fishery. And uh, now we know that there is a huge resource available about between 200 to 2000 meter depth. Uh, there are new grounds of a fin, shellfish, as well as the, some of the chimera and shark have been discovered. So this, of course, this will need uh, uh, different kinds of uh, technology for the catching this fish as well as uh, processing. But this is uh, one which is a very promising area. Also, there is another fish, which is a non-table fish, mictophid, which we have estimated about 100 million tons, which is likely to be available. And this could be extremely good for the brackish water fish as a feed. Also, there are now, because of the warming, the incidence of harmful algal bloom also is increasing. So we also provide a service where these blooms are occurring, how it is growing and how it is uh, decaying. So this information is also routinely provided so that fishermen knows that where the blooms are and if there are toxic blooms, it is advisable not to go do the fishing there. So we don't provide the advisory in those areas where the toxic algal blooms are there. So this also helps to uh, not only to save the efforts, but also the security of the human being who are likely to consume this fish. There are a lot of new uh, technology. One is on the environmental ornamental fishery. Now this is uh, being done in uh, one of the island in Lakshmi. And this has been now being managed by the women's cooperative in the island. And this is a very successful experiment. And this is now being repeated in many other islands. Also, the cage, uh, we have now developed a technology for rearing the fish into the sea cages, uh, cobia and milkfish. And this, in about 10 to 11 months, it can grow and we can have the catch, which is also. And this is the uh, new thing which is now being done. And the technology is now being perfected for the transfer to the fisherman. Also, there are many bioactive molecules and the new drugs which can be developed from this flora and fauna. There are a couple of drugs have been developed using the bioactive molecules, but there is a, it's itself is a big topic, but I just want to flag that this is also a very important area for the research. And the other important thing that we also need to look at the marine biodiversity, the census of uh, marine uh, fauna and flora is being done. And this is uh, done three degree by three degree. And it is also part of uh, ocean biogeographic information system. And uh, the Indian part is, uh, Indian Ocean part is being looked after by the Institute in India, CMLRE. And the large amount of data about more than 350,000 data is available on the different aspects, uh, right from the 
sea surface to the bottom of the sea. And this is, I think, is uh, very important. And this cannot be done by a single country. It has to be done in the collaboration with all others. At the same time, we also need to look at the coastal ecosystem and the environment. We have the complete inventory of the coastal habitats, mangroves, seagrass, coral reefs, and their health is being monitored routinely. So we know that which area is under any stress. Also, at the same time, we also find out erosional and depositional areas annually. And this is also important because many times, because of engineering activity, as well as the rise of the sea, the many areas under erosion deposition also occurs. And the impact of the sea level change, which is about three millimeter on the average, but on the Indian coast is quite varying, right from a couple of millimeter to 11 millimeter in uh, the Sundarbans. So there is a large variation in the sea level which is changing. And this is also very important because the rise of the sea level, it will affect the coastal fauna, uh, flora, especially the mangroves. And the, from the marine loving mangroves, it will change to a uh, fresh loving uh, flora will change to the marine loving. So this will also has its own issue uh, about the changing the biodiversity of the area. Also the monitoring of the water quality is being done right from 1990 onwards at the certain transects uh, routinely. So we know that where the water quality is, uh, if there is any adverse impact on the fauna. Now there is a large amount of data actually. Uh, I understand Dr. Pattavi would be there in the next uh, uh, panel discussion. And the ISO INCOIS has a large amount of data on uh, Indian Ocean, which is collected from a variety of in-situ platforms the satellite data, also some of the model outputs and some of the thematic maps. Large amount of information is available and every year it has been increasing. Uh, and this is all available to any uh, researcher who would like to use this information. And this is now being converted into what we call as a digital ocean because you, we have the very heterogeneous data like uh, uh, sea surface temperature could be from the satellite, from the in situ data, from the Argo floats. But if you want one information up across a transect for a given area, or you want to visualize in 3D, 4D, all this is being possible using the entire data. So this is what uh, I have to say uh, very quickly uh, about the what uh, we have been doing. Now, what we need to do is, uh, what we believe is beyond 2030, the growth, we will have to invest very heavily in the coastal and the ocean environments. Now, the environmental data is also going to be very critical. And we need to organize this information in such a way that we can integrate them along with the social and economic data so that we have an accounting system and we can say that how this each of the activity is benefiting the economy as well as the security of the ecology as well as the environment. And I think the most important what we lack is the institutional framework which Joel also mentioned in his initial talk that we need a system by which we can manage and govern this whole uh, ocean wealth. And I think uh, we will have to see that these oceans are managed in such a way that it is sustainable for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nayak, for this very uh, swift, very agile and very apt uh, presentation. Uh, I, I have, a, I would have, I, I think, three takeaways of your presentation, which we, we I'm sure we'll discuss later. Uh, first of all, coordination. You, you've shown coordination at the Indian level with several references to, to INCOIS, uh, which is an institute with which we've engaged a conversation in our previous workshop. We continue the con conversation in our next panel, uh, but also coordination at the global level, uh, at the international, as you were touching upon in several instances. Such, uh, I would say, 
maybe not complexity, but richness of data and uh, richness of uh, 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 resource at stake uh, actually calls for a, a true governance of, of the ocean. And this is a concept which, uh, fed by science, uh, leads for responsibility uh, to, 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 to protect and develop this resource. Uh, second takeaway, uh, which I take, um, is what you've presented on what kind of clinches uh, an old debate on the evolution of, of the stock of fishes on which uh, uh, so many million of people depend. And the ability to disentangle between uh, overfishing, which exists, and uh, ocean warming, which is a threat uh, in uh, the data uh, we have uh, uh, on, on the evolution of the population is very important. And in a sense, this ability to correct what we see by measuring in a, in a blind manner, you know, uh, Einstein would have said, and, and under the lamp, you know, uh, that we just look where we have light. Uh, by moving the attention, focusing the attention to other areas and through global mapping of the global oceans and to see where the fishes go out of climate change, I think is very important because without a good data, we can't have good decisions. The third takeaway uh, I, I would have is, and it connects beautifully to the next presentation, is the way you've presented uh, the capacities, the options we have collectively, not just to dig the ocean, not just to mine the ocean as a resource, but also to use biotechnology to develop the resource. And, and that's very promising as well. And again, that connects to the first point, first point. Once humanity enters into that, it's not a single country because it says only one ocean and uh, uh, it uh, ought to be a collective uh, endeavor. So thank you for that, for presenting what I would call the your your portfolio of uh, scientific uh, knowledge. And now we that gives me the transition to move to uh, Mrs. Akshita Sharma, uh, who, who's the portfolio, uh, biodiversity portfolio manager of uh, the AFD in Delhi. Uh, and who she will explain uh, better than I, but who handles projects that are uh, plugged onto the issues we've been uh, exploring already. And uh, especially in a region of the world where uh, we've seen that the uh, scientific, technological, uh, public ecosystem is pretty active at that. Uh, the institutes are there. Uh, we're happy to have this conversation um, develop here uh, between the analysis you've been provided, you and your colleagues and uh, in the first workshop as well, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, projects. Uh, uh, so for projects, we've already had presentations of some projects originating from the region. We'll have some more today, uh, but uh, we're happy to hear uh, Akita uh, uh, about the projects which are cooperated co-designed, supported by the AFD, notably the Delhi office. Today, we give a focus on the Delhi office. Next time, we'll give a focus uh, to the Colombo office of the AFD, and, and we'll have a look at Bangladesh as well on your activities or plans of AFD in Bangladesh. But today, uh, uh, Akita Sharma uh, is giving us a focus on, on the Delhi uh, AFD office uh, activities. Akita, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Joel, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, for being a part of this uh, workshop. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Nayak, actually. Uh, sir, it was uh, really informative in what you highlighted in terms of um, a blue economy, specifically to fisheries in India. And uh, uh, what I would like to begin my uh, discussion uh, would be primarily based on the problems we are facing within the fish fisheries uh, fishery sector in country and uh, broadly uh, for the region as well uh, in highlighting why there is an urgent need of data management and how it plays an important role in supporting the fishery uh, resource monitoring assessment and management system. Uh, 
Uh, to complement what Dr. Naik said, in order to accomplish the overarching goal of sustainable management of fish stocks, the ambitious sectoral fishery policy must necessitate on the development of an efficient monitoring and evaluation system uh, and its management. Uh, the sectoral policy for any government, I'm talking in specific for India, is built on the three pillars of autonomy, sustainability and development. As enhanced quality and credibility of fisheries research are implicit objectives, the second pillar, which is sustainability, must rely on knowledge of resources and their sustainable management. And that is why data management is of uh, utmost priority. Uh, I would like to highlight a few uh, problems which are currently being faced in the Indian fishery sector. Uh, the Indian econ exclusive economic zone has a total size of about 2.5 million kilometers square, out of which 1.5, 1.6 uh, kilometers square is of the mainland and uh, Lakshwadeep, and the remainder is that of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Now, when we talk about the data collection of the fishery stock and the stock management, the MSY computed for key stocks is higher than the monitored landings. In addition, numerous indicators and research suggest that some stocks are over or underexploited. Scientific recommendations on permissible catch should arise from a comparison of values derived from capacity evaluation, which is fish stock assessment, with those derived from resource monitoring and evaluation, which is mainly the fishing fishing mortality now however uh, the due to the expanse of india's marine region and the diversity of its habitat conducting a scientific evaluation of the stock has proven to be extremely difficult and i think dr nag would agree with me on that uh, the government of india has taken very interesting initiatives in order to assure that there is a thorough management of the stocks however uh, there are certain problems. First, the fish landing data collection in fishing ports is based of voluntary, uh, based of voluntary reporting disclosure, or disclosure from the marketing agents. There is no compulsory weighing of landing catch, and therefore the reliability of the statistics published is not highly reliable. Second, uh, for traditional fishing vessels, catch data collection at landing locations other than fishing port is based only on approximations. Uh, on such a wild coastline, gathering complete data set, set is, of course, challenging. Despite having a low capture rate per unit, these vessels account for almost 80% of the national fleet in our country, in India. Now, as a consequence, there is considerable degree of uncertainty about the quality and reliability of the available statistics, both in terms of tonnage caught and actual fishing efforts. And then, obviously, there is one high impact of the climate change. Climate change has been affecting all sorts of life and uh, blue economy, um, marine coastline is um, uh, no different from it. Uh, bio uh, climate change has highly impacted um, coastal flooding, coastal erosion. And in the coming years, we might, we might be seeing there's going to be change in oceanic temperature, acidity, freshwater input, circulation. And it, leads, it might be also leading to disruption in precipitation, temperature, and hydrology accompanying climate change. Um, these habitats, um, which are close to the uh, short ecosystem, including coral reefs, mangroves, seagrass beds, would be adversely affected by the loss and degradation of such, uh, such vital marine ecosystem. And the last problem which is being faced for the fish stock assessment in India is uh, the fishery research fleet is relatively old. The average age of the fleet size in India is about 32 years, with vessels that are not highly versatile and uh, are not adaptable to in uh, integrate new programs. So AFD, so here comes the role of AFD, how AFD can support and uh, lead to, a, lead to uh, a, a proper management of the fish, fish stocks. So uh, three interventions could be led by AFD in India. Uh, similar interventions has been already completed by AFD in other parts of the world, specifically in Indonesia. One component could be strengthening the assessment of pelagic fish resources and their sensitivity to climate change through contribution of spatial oceanography. As Mr. Na as Dr. Naik already mentioned that there is already a pelagic fish assessment being done uh, by, by India. There could be an angle of introduction of spatial 
oceanography which would, uh, which would uh, allow to maintain a minimum scientific base for stock assessment campaigns in order to allow research to keep and offering uh, recommendations to benefit the operators and decision makers uh, besides that there could be also an intervention um, uh, which could be proposed um, for uh, uh, application related to marine or maritime uh, sector management like um, coral reef and mangrove monitoring, coastal zone management, assessment of areas conducive to seaweed culture, monitoring of industrial shrimp farm and inventory uh, of uh, suitable areas uh, for such farms, spill detection and um, IUU fishing monitoring. So for component one, we could provide assistance for uh, uh, oce spatial oceanography and uh, in other way, uh, AFT could play an important role in uh, supporting the intervention for fish stock assessment is by initiating a program to renew the fisheries and uh, oceanographic research fleet. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the Indian fisheries, the oceanographic research fleet should embark on a renewal program um, and it, which will enable it to deliver the, um, deliver the services that are expected, including the assessment of um, shrimps and uh, other stocks. For this purpose, it is necessary to identify the priorities of Indian marine research for next 15 years. From this analysis, the types of vessel and equipment needed to carry out the priority scientific programs will emerge. And AFD could be a potential partner to engage or to initiate um, um, uh, uh, technical cooperation amongst Indian institutions and French institutions uh, to understand what will be the requirements in, uh, in the coming decade or two. And finally, I believe uh, another inter intervention which AFD could support is uh, in terms of improvement of the data collection and monitoring evaluation system um, in a pilot phase in India's maritime state. For example, let's say Odisha, which is a coastal state um, uh, having coastline with Bay of Bengal. Uh, so such in interventions have been already uh, proven successful by AFD in other regions of the world. And um, uh, taking an idea from this and identifying the problems uh, of fish stock assessment, I guess uh, there is high possibility uh, wherein AFD could play a major role in um, developing a system for the fishery resource monitoring assessment and management system. Uh, so that is all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Akshita. It's been uh, clear, uh, very precise, and uh, I would say uh, tempting to uh, engage uh, beyond the conversation into uh, identifying projects. The researcher in me has heard uh, many uh, opportunities to develop the research. Uh, I think we'll have uh, in comments and feedbacks uh, from uh, from uh, our panelists. Uh, I would just want to maybe flag, but I'm speaking under uh, Helen's control, that whatever you've uh, mentioned is uh, pertains to an application to, to, to your field of activity, which is India, but that it relates to uh, ways and approaches and possible modes of operation that uh, also apply to Bangladesh and, and, and Sri Lanka. I see that uh, Helen is nodding. Uh, so uh, that, that's uh, very much in this spirit of also sharing experiences across uh, countries within the region uh, that, that, that we are operating. So thank you so, uh, so much, Akita, for this uh, apt uh, presentation. Uh, I'll hand over the floor now to uh, Nishan Pereira from the Blue Resources Trust in, in Sri Lanka. Then after that, we move to, to Bangladesh. Uh, Nishan, you're a marine biologist, uh, but you're also an underwater photographer. So I'll be interested to know what is the depth. We've understood that the deep sea has uh, lost its secrets to scientists. Uh, we want to know when it will lose its secrets to photographers. Um, you have an interest, a very specialized interest in coral reef ecology uh, and in their link with fisheries and marine protected area management. Uh, and let me add that you've previously worked with the IUCN, um, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is, uh, which is an important dispositive uh, with which AFD, of course, is engaging uh, as well and with which the bridge tank is uh, engaging. 
let me add that your current research uh, includes uh, field studies on seahorses. You'll maybe tell us why the seahorses are a good indicator of the health and the data of, uh, of the ocean on coral reefs, as I said, and on sustainable small scale fisheries. That aspect of small scale fishery will be important as well as we're discussing data. Data ought to be accessible by uh, the large fisheries, but also the small scale fisheries. We're again touching to uh, the governance of resources, not just at the resource level, but also in terms of equality of access and equality of responsibility to contribute to uh, the sustainability of, of the, the resources. Uh, Nishan, with this brief uh, uh, introduction, I'll hand over the floor to you. Uh, understanding that uh, to our previous exchanges that you'll be talking about resource management challenges in Sri Lanka, the links between science and research uh, focusing on coral risks and uh, about moving forward on the management and sustainable financing mechanisms as policy tools. And uh, that is very important to us as well as we'll keep moving the conversation towards projects, but also with the policymakers. Uh, Nishan, you, based on this, have the floor. Thank you, Joel. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone and uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, let me just put this few slides on the screen. Yeah, just to start, uh, I think the other speakers gave uh, a pretty good introduction, uh, even though Dr. Nayak spoke mostly from an Indian perspective, I think it kind of applies uh, across the region. Uh, and I will try to speak a little bit uh, from a Sri Lankan perspective, which I think has very similar uh, issues and challenges to the other neighboring countries in the region, but also maybe touch a little bit on some of the current initiatives uh, going on in Sri Lanka that um, at both the national level and with uh, collaborations at the international and regional scale. Um, Sri Lanka obviously has, like the other countries in the region, a, a lot of challenges. Uh, as an island nation as well, we are, suffer we are struggling and dealing with ecosystem degradation as a major issue. Uh, I think the speakers before pointed out very uh, correctly the impacts of climate change. Uh, changes to uh, fishing grounds uh, and stocks and availability of resources, as well as degradation of ecosystems. Uh, my background working in coral reefs uh, brings me very close to this uh, because of the impacts of coral bleaching and uh, coral mortality due to uh, changes in sea surface temperature. Uh, we've had major bleaching events in 1998 and 2016. Uh, smaller events in several other years, which have led to uh, up to a 95% loss of coral cover on uh, reefs in Sri Lanka, as well as in the region. Uh, I know in the Lakshadweep, Nic uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and in the Maldives as well. Um, and of course, anthropogenic impacts as well, because of the use of destructive fishing methods and also overfishing, particularly in coastal ecosystems, because of the nature of our fisheries, being dependent on coastal fisheries and uh, a large number of small fishing units. The fishing effort is distributed amongst a large number of units that are kind of creating a more um, extensive fishery, more efficient fishery methods that uh, are linking. And again, this links with the whole blue economy concept and also the fact that actions around the world are impacting uh, local ecosystems and resources uh, everywhere. A uh, lot of Sri Lanka's recent uh, ecosystem degradation and uh, stock reduction in terms of anthropogenic impacts have been driven by export-oriented fisheries. So uh, changes in global markets and demands for certain products, um, particularly reef brace products, as well as pelagic species like sharks for shark, fin, uh, shark fins, shark liver oil, as well as manta ray, gill plates have driven extensive growth of certain fisheries beyond a sustainable level. The issue is not the fisheries themselves, but the scale and the nature or lack of management of it. Um, there is, we're also constrained by a lot of policy contradictions, which links to the next point of sectoral institutional approaches. There hasn't been a kind of a more cohesive approach towards a national policy at a policy level and also at uh, an implementation and research and data gathering level, uh, we tend to be working in silos uh, at an institutional and individual level, 
rather than feeding into, into a more national process. Uh, this, of course, leads to uh, significant data gaps, uh, sometimes for the absence of data, but also sometimes uh, the lack of coordination and communication, which makes it uh, end up that some of the data is not actively used for management decision making. And of course, this leads to economic losses, both in terms of you know, loss in income from fisheries and also in terms of under-exploitation of certain resources that we can access. Um, as we heard earlier about uh, some of the new fisheries that they're developing in India, these are options for Sri Lanka to also explore as we expand our fisheries and kind of diversify our fisheries. And for Sri Lanka as a, as a relatively small island state, tourism is a very important part of our economy, a uh, very important part of our blue economy in terms of marine resources and ocean resources. Uh, balancing these uh, kind of things as well as ports and shipping, uh, which are key components of our economy and finding those balances is key and a challenge that we face. So the requirements come from a variety. We often, I work in research management, uh, resource management and, and research. Uh, we tend to be kind of often clumped together with conservationists. Uh, of course, there is a conservation interest here in terms of uh, globally significant species. Uh, Sri Lanka is assignated to most global uh, treaties and we have several global obligations uh, and we are working on that, but also for fisheries management. Uh, improving our stock management requires a lot of data and, uh, and information and better policy as well as shipping industry. Um, and ideally this, we wanna look at spatial planning. Uh, I spoke about competing sectors, and I think the challenge for Sri Lanka is basically better spatial planning of, of our seascape, which, which is currently, uh, I think, something we are looking at, but we have a long way to go uh, in terms of using this so that we can actually expand all these different sectors uh, more effectively uh, without kind of compromising the, the gains to be had from each sector. Fisheries and tourism tend to be the ones that are constantly at odds with each other. So these are things that we need to work on resolving. So some of the critical data, I think um, the presentation earlier went through a lot of this in detail for India, but this applies across the board. So I won't go into too much detail, but you know, a better resource inventory for Sri Lanka and particularly long-term trends. We don't have really good temporal monitoring of our resources. Uh, this is kind of uh, an issue with financing and funding as well. Uh, we need to look at kind of as a solution, better financing mechanism to sustain long-term research rather than a more project intervention-based approach that seems to have permeated through Sri Lanka over the last few decades or maybe even up to 50 years. I think that is something where we are struggling with uh, in terms of long-term data. We do have kind of sporadic bits of data, but they tend to be isolated studies that rather than you know, building on research that we're doing. Uh, better fishery stock assessment, um, including fishing effort. Uh, again, we heard earlier about the issues with small scale fisheries. This is uh, across the region and in Sri Lanka as well. Uh, we have a lot of uh, IUU fishing, which is illegal, unreported and unregulated fisheries. Uh, this happens in the high seas fishery as well as the coastal fishery. Uh, we have a lot of small scale fishery landing sites from which data is not always uh, collected. And the data is also missing components of the catch that is discarded as bycatch or used in other ways. So interestingly, uh, around 2012, there was a historical stock assessment done uh, across the world. And for the Sri Lankan stock assessment, I was privileged to be part of that. And we found that you know we are underreporting our overall catches by about seventy percent. So you're you're basically not accounting for about seventy percent of the actual catch in your fishery landing statistics. Uh, some of it because of poor data collection. Sometimes because of issues like uh, discarded bycatch and other issues. So we need to look at improving our data collection to capture this. And sometimes continuing to do these kinds of modeling. Um, efforts to kind of better understand the actual fishing effort and the actual impact on the resources. Uh, this links with ecosystem health, uh, critical ecosystems like coral reefs and seagrasses that are uh, 
important not just for biodiversity, but as a nursery and breeding grounds and also for coastal protection. Uh, we have major issues with uh, coastal erosion in areas where we have lost coast, uh, coral reefs. So kind of better ecosystem health and monitoring of these uh, oceanographic parameters and of course, socioeconomic data. This is another, another aspect that often gets neglected that we need to be tapping into. So I'll talk a little bit about ongoing initiatives. Um, some of these uh, my organization has had some involvement with, but these are all linked to larger national level uh, initiatives. Uh, we work closely with the Sri Lankan uh, Department of Fisheries and the Department of Wildlife Conservation, as well as the Marine Environmental Protection Authority. I think the chairperson of that is on the panel too today, so you probably hear more about uh, some of these initiatives going on in Sri Lanka, as well as other work that is happening in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, there, this is not a comprehensive list of everything, but just a little bit of a touch base of what kind of work is going on. Uh, on a, on a smaller scale than, for example, India, but it is, it is a preliminary efforts, I think, of trying to build a more comprehensive data collection method and protocol for Sri Lanka. Uh, one of these is uh, efforts to conduct habitat mapping. Uh, this is some of the work that I have been personally involved with, looking at mapping coral reefs and doing habitat classifications. We are looking at mapping all the coral reefs in Sri Lanka now, uh, together with the Wildlife Department uh, and the Ministry of Environment. Um, and this allows us to monitor change over time and impacts of coral bleaching, spatial planning for our marine protected area management, uh, which has so far not been based on this kind of data, but something that we want to build towards linking the research that's happening on the ground and kind of linking that with policy and decision making. This also takes use of or takes advantage of global initiatives. This is uh, a screenshot of the Allen Coral Atlas. This is a global initiative to map all the uh, world's coral reefs, as well as associated ecosystems like seagrasses. Um, it's still in its early stages, but this process has begun. Uh, Sri Lanka is in the process of signing uh, a government level MOU with the uh, Vulcan Group, which is uh, supporting this globally financially. Um, and this will allow us to access satellite Im imagery uh, remote sensing data and build more accurate habitat maps for Sri Lanka. Uh, we've been working with the Australian Institute of Marine Science on a global effort to document uh, the populations of reef sharks and rays, so elasmobranchs, which are very vulnerable and targeted by fisheries. So we use a uh, kind of uh, baited underwater cameras that we deploy underwater. This is a standardized methodology used around the world. Uh, there is one paper that recently came out in Nature and there's a few others coming out looking at uh, ass assessing the status of reef sharks and ray populations around the world. You can see the impacts of fisheries and the habitat preferences of these and we can look at our conservation and management priorities based on this. This is just a, I just threw in a little bit of footage from that. Uh, I couldn't resist just to uh, liven up uh, an afternoon in the subcontinentary time zone now. Uh, so that just when we are getting tired, we can look at some sharks and uh, turtles swimming around as well. But uh, this is an important step. Since 2012, Sri Lanka has been actively working towards uh, establishing and improving our vessel monitoring system as part of our obligations to the IOTC, the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. Uh, we have now uh, implemented VMS on most of our offshore fisheries fleet. We are now trying to implement this on some of our inshore uh, vessels fishing within our EZ as well. Um, and uh, this allows us to track uh, our fishing fleet, uh, monitor fishing effort, as well as reduce uh, IOU fishing. Um, again, um, Sri Lanka is uh, an active player in the IOTC, and the IOTC also showcases the global nature of our fisheries. Um, it's interesting, this is, event is linked with AFD. Uh, France as an individual state and also through the European Union is also a member of the IOTC. So the IOTC is not just Indian Ocean countries, but is actually uh, a collaboration or uh, coming together of many nations which actually target and exploit the fishery stocks of the Indian Ocean. So it's not only the Indian Ocean nations that are fishing in the Indian Ocean, but it's all these other countries as well. So this requires a lot more global level collaboration in coming together in terms of our uh, resource management. 
Uh, there is work happening on satellite tagging in Sri Lanka, again, looking at some of our migratory species um, linked with uh, better managing them. Uh, oceanographic monitoring, this is something that uh, I think uh, Sri Lanka is only just starting. Um, we are having efforts to establish uh, coral reef early warning systems called the CRUISE system, which is initiated by NOAA in the US, and they're establishing stations around the world. Um, we also link with uh, oceanographic monitoring uh, efforts around the world to collect better data to support our monitoring. And particularly with climate change, this allows us to kind of predict uh, changes over time and also forecast uh, potential changes to uh, proactively manage resources and spatial planning, including uh, access rights and fishery fishing grounds. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll just finish with this. Um, in a digital era, we this is where some of the, the work, the data, and the resources kind of come become more of a useful tool. Uh, the app below on the on the bottom uh, picture is actually an app uh, that Blue Resources Trust is supporting the development of, uh, which is to basically identify individual sharks using uh, a photograph of a dried fin. Uh, as you are aware, the shark fin trade is a major, major component of, of wildlife trade. It comes under CITES. Several of these species are now listed under CITES Appendix 2, uh, which allows limited trade, but a major challenge has been to identify species uh, once the fin is dried it's because they are, they are traded as dried fins. And this is a challenge for customs officials uh, because there are some species that you can export or cannot export or permitted to export. So this is an app where you can feed in a photograph and kind of try and identify um, uh, the, the species, which will be used uh, around the world for customs officials. We've had several workshops here training customs officials on several aspects of this, as well as identification of other species to implement CITES better in Sri Lanka so that we can do this. Since you uh, mentioned seahorses in my introduction, this is also linked with seahorses. There are efforts to kind of identify dried seahorses uh, using photographs because seahorses are also listed on CITES Appendix 2 for restricted trade with permit. So, um, while the policy level decisions have taken place, there are these kind of obstacles and challenges of implementing these things. I think CITES is a very useful tool uh, because I mentioned earlier that Sri Lanka's resource exploitation has been heavily influenced by export markets, uh, so international trade. Uh, using tools like CITES uh, to manage trade uh, and also supporting and strengthening the implementation of that through tools like this can support um, you know, uh, resource management, conservation, on the ground level. And this is also linking to kind of, I mean, I kind of mentioned this earlier in terms of sustainable financing, a challenge for uh, resource management and research. Um, like I mentioned, we have a kind of a, a more initiative based approach uh, to financing this. So kind of building more innovative funding mechanisms, I think, Things are changing. There are a multitude of financial tools being used globally for uh, marine resource management and conservation. These include things like blue bonds, um, similar to green bonds, also private sector funding, uh, venture capital uh, kind of fundraising for and using kind of investment-based funds uh, that support marine conservation and, and driving investment in more sustainable practices as a tool to supporting and financing research and through that conservation and resource management. So that's part of the future. There are initiatives going on globally. Uh, Sri Lanka is party to these discussions and initiatives. Um, and I think is trying to take positive steps in this regard. And um, hopefully uh, we can work together with the other partners in the region and build on their existing partnerships and hopefully move forward into better resource management, not just in Sri Lanka, but throughout the South Asian region. And with that, I shall end it. Thank you. And this is just to end it, since I am a photographer, this is uh, actually a photograph of a coral reef where I work extensively, where most of my research is carried out on the east coast of Sri Lanka. This reef has been recently very heavily impacted by coral bleaching. Uh, caused by climate change, but has shown signs of recovering. And we are currently in the stage of 
uh, monitoring this as this has recently been declared as a marine sanctuary and we're trying to support the management plan and uh, establishment of management network for these marine protected areas. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nishan, for this very uh, graphic presentation. Uh, we had understood already that the ocean had lost its secrets to uh, scientists. Now we understand that its, its inhabitants have lost their intimacy to photographers and uh, videographists. Uh, on, on a more serious note, uh, but, but this is serious also, it's also a way to document. But on an even more serious note, I would say, Thank you very much for giving a lively picture of all the activities uh, of your organization and that happen in Sri Lanka and that connect to global endeavors that gives food for thought uh, for other uh, participants in this panel and discussions who presented in the previous uh, workshop. Uh, I'm seeing Arnab uh, Das, I'm uh, seeing uh, Chime Yodan. Uh, uh, Sarap Tako, uh, Mr. Wahab will most likely want to, to interact and react on that. Uh, so in the interest, in the interest of time uh, I'll, I'll, for, this, uh, for this conversation, uh, and not, sorry, forgetting to thank you also for putting a very important point, which is financing. Uh, financing is key, is of essence, and uh, as, uh, well, the AFD, AFD is a development bank and supports initiatives, that was very important to mention for you that you mentioned the variety of financing sources and uh, in a sense maybe blended finance uh, public private partnership in solutions and in finance ought to be could be a, a topic for further con for next conversation so thank you for that uh, in the interest of saving some time for uh, conversation uh, may I request uh, uh, mr uh, Khan to uh, take the floor and to stick like other uh, participants to, to 10 minutes, uh, Mr. Abdu, uh, Abu sorry, Saleh Khan, who is the Executive Director of the Institute of Water Modeling of Bangladesh. Uh, Mr. Khan, you have a career which illustrates perfectly uh, what we, we all try to do, which is to have the academia, the projects, the government uh, interact because you've been in these three lines of businesses or activities. Uh, you uh, have a specialization in hydromorphological impact assessment uh, 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 using uh, mathematical models. You, in your career of 30 years, you've been associated in planning and management of water resources, uh, notably in the Bangladesh Water Development Board, sorry, the public sector, uh, where you've worked on major flood control, uh, but also irrigation and drainage projects, which also pertains to the fact that water in the sea and of course water on the land are, are connected. That's something we've touched upon before. Now, uh, you are now with the Institute of Water Modeling, and uh, from our earlier conversation, your conversation with our team, I understand you'll touch upon the potentials of the blue economy, especially in terms of shipping and port facilities, fisheries and aquaculture and energy and tourism, freshwater harvesting, as I was mentioning, the two waters in a sense connect, uh, data collection, monitoring and issues, and more importantly, the Bay of Bengal model and issues related to value chain of blue economy and climate change. And uh, I know your institute has solutions for those issues, which you'll uh, be likely to, to flag. Uh, Professor Khan, uh, you have the floor. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'll tell some briefly about IWM. It's an uh, independent trust, non-profit organization formed by the government of Bangladesh in 1996. Uh, primarily to support the water and environment sector of Bangladesh. Uh, we are working now in Bangladesh and overseas also, in India, Malaysia, and other countries. So basically we use mathematical modeling tools and uh, state of art data collection techniques to support the water resource development projects. Uh, uh, in Bangladesh, the government and the uh, NGOs, private sector, wherever uh, there is an opportunity, we support with the tools that are developed at the center. So I'll just not read what blue economy is, but I'll uh, state that 
for Bangladesh, blue economy is a new area, very untapped area, because we have been concentrating more on the land-based interventions and also on the disasters that occur in Bangladesh. So right now, more focus is going to the development of blue economy in Bangladesh. So uh, uh, a caution would be preservation and regeneration, because when you go for exploitation, excess ex exploitation may result in disaster in future. So as you can see, uh, Bangladesh has an exclusive economic zone, which is 119 approximately 1000 kilometers square, still unknown to us, a lot of data is not there, though we have seen that our Indian friends have a lot of information uh, that can be shared with us. So uh, we are also right now planning to collect a lot of information over here uh, for the benefit of Bangladesh. So there is a potential of capture fisheries, agriculture, energy, biotechnology, submarine mining, tourism, land recreation, shipping and port facilities. As you can see, we have already uh, three ports functioning, Mongla, Paira, Chittagong, and Cox's Bazaar is another, but it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you can say that it's a tourism spot also. And 94% of our foreign trade is done to these ports. So there is a huge potential of feeder service from India, Sri Lanka, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Myanmar ports, and also Ports can be utilized by Nepal, Bhutan, and northeastern regions of India. Potentials for building deep sea ports exist, and already Bangladesh is already considering constructing one deep sea port. Fisheries sector consists of 25% of the agriculture GDP, 3.76% of the total GDP. The marine fisheries have, has been a very untapped sector for Bangladesh. Actually, Bangladesh is very fortunate to have freshwater fisheries, and uh, we like uh, our freshwater fishes in our meals. So there's, uh, but there is a extremely big potential. As you can see, there are big fishing grounds in the oceans, which uh, I can say that Bangladesh has relatively not tapped in, but this is a sector that will grow right now. At this moment, World Bank is funding a fisheries, uh, marine fisheries special planning project uh, where IWM is going to lead. That means we will be collecting a lot of information of fish catches that happens in the Bay of Bengal. So there is coastal capture fisheries, marine capture, marine aquatic, shrimp, shrimp culture has been developing in the coast. And it is uh, actually in conflict with the agriculture. So that is a big question for us. Another area is the oil and gas exploration. It's a huge area where uh, we feel that a lot of potential is there and renewable energy. Uh, these uh, uh, energy potentials have not been uh, assessed by Bangladesh. There is a uh, potential for wave energy, wind energy, and blue energy. As you can see, uh, Sri Lankan uh, uh, participant presenter already said the tourism. Uh, we have uh, tourist spots in Shundabans, Kuakata, and Cox's Bazaar. Lately, Bangladesh government has taken up uh, programs for development of Shonadia Island as a tourist spot, Shabrang as a tourist spot, and St. Martin's Island as a tourist spot. So these other tourist spots are coming in. Another area thought by the Ministry of Water Resources is the huge potential of fresh water that we can store and then export. So there, uh, there is a pilot project now being taken up for harvesting of this fresh water in one of the channels in the coast and another between two islands. As a modeling center, we are more interested to know the developments that will happen in the Bay of Bengal in the coming 100 years. So IWM, in uh, collaboration with uh, Netherlands and the Denmark institutes and two uh, US universities have been uh, trying to uh, develop tools for forecasting what will happen in the next 
100 years to the coast of Bangladesh. As you can see some of the results over here for the long-term morphological changes in the Meghna estuary, we are trying to uh, gather where the uh, uh, land mass will be developed so that we can plan our interventions, the drainage patterns and other infrastructures that will be required. There is also, as I have mentioned, that was a natural phenomena. This phenomena can be accelerated by uh, constructing cross dams. And that also we have studied at the modeling center. You can, if you can construct this three cross dam as shown in the figure, there is a potential of 60,000 hectares in 30 years can be developed uh, in this area. That means uh, land hungry country of Bangladesh may develop another Bangladesh in the Bay of Bengal in future. The issues and activities and extreme events uh, I've highlighted in this slide, we have issues like water logging, declining man mangrove forest, vulnerability of the Meghna estuary, the vulnerability of the Hilsha uh, swanning. Actually, the Hilsha fish is very popular as a meal uh, for Bangladeshis. Erosion and sedimentation in the coastal islands, vulnerability of the long sandy beach in the coast uh, in the southeast eastern part of Bangladesh, vulnerability of the coastal reef water logging in the northeast, uh, southeast region of Bangladesh. And we have the activities that are going out is fish culture, port development, tourist spot development, gas mining, ship breaking. These are some of the activities that are happening in the coast of Bangladesh. We have the extreme events that we find is the severe cyclonic storm surge, climate change and sea level rise, which are becoming a reality now. So exploring the blue resources, we find the finding the potentials and hyd hydrological and morphological data is very important. So at the center, we have the bathymetry of the Bay of Bengal, and we have a model for it. With this model, we can generate water level, we can generate salinity, temperature, sediment concentration, and we can have water quality assessments also. But the importance is that we have the tool, but the measurements are very scarce or project driven. So uh, actually uh, it's time that the government of Bangladesh uh, takes in long-term measurements in the coast, which will be very beneficial in order to see the sea level rise and climate change impacts of Bangladesh. And we can correlate the model results with the actual measurements that will be done. So what, what we are lacking is that we don't have the appropriate vessels, equipment and technology for offshore survey and monitoring. I think over here, AFD can concentrate more and helping the Bangladesh government uh, with assistance in procuring vessels, equipment and providing technologies for offshore survey and monitoring. This is the model I was talking about. Uh, we can, the models uh, generates water level and depth waves, cyclonic storm surges. We can forecast cyclonic storm surges in Bangladesh. And also we have uh, found by hind casting that our models are quite accurate. We can generate the salinity profile in the bay also, which will be very interesting for the fisheries sector. Uh, we can support the neighboring countries, India, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar with the tools we have with us. The model can be used for climate change scenario, uh, analysis also. So issues uh, related to the blue economy in the Bay of Bengal is that protecting the balance of environment by uh, avoiding over exploitation, which I have, have emphasized earlier. So that means we have to have the knowledge, expert workforce technology for exporting offshore resources and know about the climate change. Otherwise, we may be uh, taking in measures which might affect the resources that are available in the Bay of Bengal. So the issues that we are more, uh, more alarmed now is the coastal flooding, coastal erosion, salinity intrusion, frequent cyclones and storm surges. And this affects the agriculture, shipping and trade, energy and tourism. And if we have a better management, then we can have improved fisheries management, breeding species adapted to climate change, financial assistance to the fishers, diversified tourism activities, and constructing salinity barriers. 
So as you can see, the resource identification is a very important factor where your data collections, data monitoring, and data preservation will be important. And as you can see, already two, uh, two agencies have come up with requests for marine special planning. The fisheries is one of the agencies, and latest is the BIWTA. They are wanting the navigation routes as marine special planning. Policy for exploration of the blue economy. So if you have a better understanding of what is available and uh, the knowledge and the technology of monitoring this, then we can have investments, training and capacity and sustainable exploration of the resources. That's all from my side. Actually, we are a very tech, highly technical institute providing a modeling support to the different agencies in Bangladesh and also the donors. Thank you very much for giving me this time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Khan, and thank you for sticking to the time. Uh, and, and thank you for already establishing links and you know, relations with, with, with the other presentations. Uh, uh, I think some kind of conversation is cropping. Now, for a conversation to really crop, uh, we need now to enter a, a discussion phase, an interaction phase. And while I thank all of you for uh, keeping on time, maybe the moderator has not been able to uh, keep enough time for this conversa conversation within the time frame of the so-called first panel, which ends in, in, in five minutes. Uh, as we have a second panel, as you all are uh, de facto participants uh, to uh, the second panel, and as I would really want, and I'm speaking under your control, uh, Arnab, uh, Chime, uh, Sorab, uh, Wahab, to give their comments, to exchange, interact with the participants. I suggest, and we've uh, discussed with, with the EFD, that we will all move on time to the second panel. Uh, we have to change our Zoom link uh, for technical reasons. Uh, that Jackie will give his takeaway on the process and that you will give uh, Arnab, if you feel, feel like, Chime, uh, uh, Sorab and, and Wahab, uh, your feedback on, on this panel and the whole exercise uh, straight on, which uh, anyway, you've been part of the process since the beginning, some of you since the inception phase and, and, and then we'll proceed with the other speakers of the panels. That will also help the speakers of the next panel who are landing on our exercise to get uh, acquainted to, to our, our way of approaching. If you all agree with, with this, we'll do that in three minutes. Dot. Now, I just wanted to check uh, maybe with, uh, with the speakers, uh, with Dr. Nayak, uh, with Nishan, uh, whether you have, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Mr. Khan, whether you have to leave at the end of this panel or you can stay at least a bit at the beginning of the second panel, in which case those of you who have to leave, which is very understandable, timekeeping is important. We have three minutes for you to some comments, crisps, and uh, unless you can stay. Dr. Nayak, do you have to, yeah, your mic? Yeah, yes. I, I have to go, but uh, I'm sure that uh, my colleagues are there, Arnab and uh, Patabi would be there, I think. So they would be able to provide any input back to me, feedback to me, yes. Okay. Any reaction from now, as we have the last two minutes of your precious time, uh, many, any feedback on what you heard uh, from Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and how we might all want to proceed uh, and go ahead. And then Wahab will have one quick intervention. But Wahab, we can also, if you stay, can stay with us to the next uh, panel, you, you'll have time to, to interact, Wahab. Mr. Nayak? Yeah, I think uh, the most important thing is uh, to have a framework of uh, collection of the data on the variety of the issues which are there. And uh, the important thing is that uh, the information flow, how it could be flowing from one place to other. And uh, of course, we have the uh, system, what we call as the ocean 
uh, data and information system, what we call as a ODIS, uh, which is as a large amount of data on the Indian Ocean. And uh, it is open. I mean, we all can get the data from the INCOIS website. Uh, we need to see that how best we can further improve upon the information. And then, of course, uh, there are different models and which we can provide uh, services. And in the long term, of uh, what we need is uh, the climate services. That means we need to focus for a much longer time than what is available as of now. See, currently we provide short term forecast, uh, but we may need uh, seasonal and uh, even decadal forecast, what is likely to happen. I think that is what we should uh, plan ultimately, that how we can introduce the climate services in this region. Thank you very much. That's a word uh, not of conclusion, but that's a word of transition to uh, uh, our next panel. I thank all of you uh, who have to leave, and uh, I, I invite uh, all of you who can stay to uh, to stay with us, to connect to the other link. I thank our audience and uh, uh, we are closing this panel now and continuing the conversation in, in our closed door uh, exchanges with, uh, with actors. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.